But it gets even more spectacular. I mean, these are just regular writers born in Stockholm. There's also a special kind of um, writers born in, uh, in Sweden. So let's have a look at um, those writers, or those people in general, who have won a Nobel Prize. That would be cool. So um, let's look for the Swedish Nobel laureates. I hope there are some, right? Are there? Oh, yes, look at them. Oh, quite a few, actually. Good. So, now we have those people who um, won a Nobel Prize. Let's now <coughs> try to match them against Fiat. So basically, we're looking for somebody who is the same as this person. Let's also retrieve their name from VF. That would be cool. So, well, there you have the names. But of course, this doesn't help you. What if you're at a library and you want to read a work written by a Swedish Nobel Prize winner? You can also do that. So suppose that we're, let's say, at the Harvard Library, and now we want to read a book by one of these guys. Well, it's really simple. We can just have a look at um, books that have as contributor. One of those guys. So here we go. And let's also have the uh, title of this book. So, what's happening here? Okay, so lots of guys apparently. Let's have a look at this Samuel song, whoever he is. So let's first see... Um, he won a Nobel Prize for, um, yeah, for biochemistry, apparently. Interesting. He has this VF identifier right here. So that's definitely this guy, born in 1934. And what kind of books does he have in Harvard? Well, let's have a look. And if Harvard is up, yes, it is. Here we see this kind of book, well, he did a conference on his research, and there's a guy who did the proceedings of his conference. So this is how we get works by Swedish Nobel Prize winners. I don't know if you realize, but this is actually the first time in history that we query three linked data sources from a browser live on stage. And it gets even better. <coughs> you can do this yourself. And we can say, I don't write Sparkle, but that's not a problem. So I've shown you three queries right now. I will tweet each of those three queries so you can try them yourself. Uh, don't be afraid, you cannot crash my server because it's a very lively server. You might crash the Wi Fi network. So we want them all together, just try them separately. And if you want to know how you can write your own queries, well, here's a tweet with a blog post that explains how you can do exactly that. So, fair bit query, live on stage, there you go. The next part is um, you might be wondering, okay, wow, triple pattern fragments, it's cool, it works, I've seen this, but is it actually used? Well, it's interesting to know that DPF exists in the wild as well. Since um, October 2014, DBpedia has an official triple pattern fragments interface. So, yes, it's used for the biggest data set in the linked data cloud. How badly or how good is it actually used? Well, what we've seen is from the first four full months of DBpedia triple pattern fragments, we've seen that there were more than 4 million requests. So, yes, people actually do use it. So, it's a safe bet. Then, of course, the question, was the server up? Was this thing available? Well, we had 99.9994 person, no, 9994 person availability, which means we have one minute of that then, somewhere in November, with DP apologize for that one. So can you use it in production? Is it stable? Yes. Can, you, can people use it to create your data set in a federated way? Yes, it's possible. And if you want to know about how lightweight the interface is, well, there's something called Lot Laundromat, which is a, a web server that harvests linked data sets from all over the web, and currently there's 600,000 something in, in them, and just for a total of 38 billion triples. And each of those interfaces has also a triple pattern fragment interface, so that's 600,000 plus data sets you can already query today now, and they're hosted on one machine. So one machine is able to host this many triples, this many data sets. So I'm sure that your machine, whatever it is, can at least host one interface. That must be possible. Was this great or was this great? <laughs> Who hates it here? <laughs> of course, we are now going to ask you to implement it in your own uh, Library. So here are some links uh, to the, all the specifications, but of course we don't want to read text, we want to do stuff. So if you want to do stuff, well, I, I didn't know anything about, uh, or, uh, I knew a tiny bit of, of the big data, but this service convinced me I had to do something in our own uh, library. So I took one of the uh, servers here, it's, it's, it's an easy, very easy 
install, I installed uh, next to a uh, uh, service I had, and I immediately could produce data, because all the data I produced for Harvard, I did it in one day. So in one day I, post, I processed 180 million triples, it's the easy thing, just the most easy thing you can get <coughs> from a mark to a double core, and then you can then, then produce this uh, data. Of course we can spend much more time on better formats and better data for uh, uh, yeah. the but already uh, uh, show you can do stuff now, you, yeah, you, I, I don't have to, uh, uh, to uh, wait. So I really urge you to go to this website and read all about the, yes. the uh, software that is there in, 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 in open source and please uh, and contribute. Thank you. Impressing demonstration of what is, let's say, easily possible yeah. um, with linked data. And maybe it answers already some of uh, the questions of uh, one of our workshops. While of course this is more the, the the interface for, let's say, the people who know what they are doing and not for end yeah. users. But um, still, yeah. But I think we have Open. questions. Yeah. Oh, so okay. Just yes. <laughs> Using an earlier again, uh, I'm sure you had this question before. So, have you considered the cost of the data throughput this guy right. in data fragments? Because I assume they mm -hmm. must be higher because you exchanged uh, significantly more data. Because That's in really many really hosting solutions, the data cost is quite significantly fresh. <laughs> Yes, indeed. So, it is a trade-off here, obviously. I mean, you can't have everything. You can't have a lightweight server, no bandwidth, and super fast queries. As you have seen, the queries go a little bit slower than with a Sparkle endpoint. So, what we want to say is, with this kind of query system, a query might take 3 seconds. On a Sparkle endpoint, it might take 0 0.3 seconds. But this works 3 seconds all the time. But what you pay for those 3 seconds is, indeed, the bandwidth that goes on all the time. But the good news is, since the questions are really simple, more and more people and users are using the same questions to get different answers. Mm -hmm. For a Spark and Endpoint, each question is different. So this means caching is much more effective. So all of the bandwidth doesn't have to be done by the server. The cache can take a lot of it. And caching in the web is really, really cheap. So the answer to that is caching. We reuse the mechanisms of the web that have proven successful in the past years already. Yeah, more questions? Can I say something quickly then? Yeah, sure. I think the main takeaway here is that there's no excuse left not to publish your linked data in yes. a variable way. We had lots of excuses in the past, like Spark endpoints are too expensive, too complicated. I mean, the software is there, you can just put it on top of your server like Patrick did. So you don't have any excuse left to not publish your linked data. And if you publish it this way, people can execute queries on it just like I did before. So think about this, it's really something that can come to the end user if you Stop having excuses for publishing data. Okay, but then maybe I have a question um, because um, you you only touched the, the topic of, of the role of, of Kathmandu in this thing. Because Kathmandu is in the end, um, let's say, the, the thing that does the mapping between the legacy formats and leaked data. Yeah? yeah. And uh, this is, I think, one of the concerns in the library world as well, um, how to do that, let's say, properly, yeah, and uh, so, so I think this is one of, it's not so much the, 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 the technology that a spark your, spark your um, endpoint might be expensive or something, but um, this, maybe you can say something yeah, about that. Certainly, the, in the library world, you don't have to uh, worry about that, because the, the tools are there, so you have uh, things like, uh, you have but there are many tools, uh, uh, meta factor tools, you have, have uh, and Ruby tools, and, and Python tools, there are, uh, there are enough tools there that, the, uh, that they have, have in a library the total control how your data is being processed. You don't have to give it away to um, uh, an, uh, an external uh, 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 person. You as a librarian can use these tools and can really see how this mapping is uh, is being used, and that's the very important part. You are the owner of the uh, data, so 
Do yes. something with uh, this. Is. Right, thank you. Okay. okay. Anything else? Questions, <coughs> remarks? No. Okay. Then thank you very, very much.